Oh. You're a ball, ball, ball. And our, you're recording now. My yeah. Vocal exercises. Hey, it's the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up, the worst technical setup of the ever a stand-up. I came into my office and I You found look great, Scott. You look great. Yeah. You suck. <laughs> I've got this machine that's doing that thing and it's been stuck there for a while. And then this other machine is stuck. You can't see it, but it's also stuck. This is a laptop I had lying around. It's absolute chaos. I am very uncomfortable that these machines are not working, so I'm just going to pass it off to you guys and hide. Yeah, I think the only thing that we can possibly do to make this better is you should just have a fourth machine that's dedicated to the ASP.NET community standard. That's all there is to it. That yeah. You're not allowed to touch. You Literally. cannot upgrade it. You can't add cameras. Yeah, I mean, I do like my betas. You do like <laughs> betas, don't you? I do like my betas. <laughs> This this machine is on whatever the main line is, not not beta. Okay. But could we could we just have the Hanselbot like that's up in the in the office like come over to your house? Like it would be a long journey, but it could like you know, live tweet as it goes. This is the universe's way of making me sympathetic because usually it's Damon who has Damon who has trouble with this. Yep, your turn. And I'm just like, <laughs> come on, Damien, how hard is it to copy and paste the URL? Uh, so this is what the universe does to me. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're half an hour late, so we'll. I think you have to. You're gonna. I'm, I'm taking the hit for this one. Great. I'm okay. Now. Goodbye. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, John, you love community, right? I sure do. All right. I love community. Me, let me do this thing. I have to, and then I'm switching over to that, and boom. Okay. Yeah, so this is. This is kind of a meta thing here, but this uh, the first post is a post about uh, the community stand-up. So uh, Jeff wrote up this cool thing from last week. Uh, we're going to try and do these regularly, so this has all the links up at the top. People always ask where are the links, so uh, we include the links here at the top of this, and then we've got a full Q&A log, so pretty neat. But the really exciting post, I think, last week was this um, Ben um, from Age of Ascent wrote up this... Thing. It's got pictures of cake, it's got graphs, it's all kinds of goodness. You want to see something really disgusting? It, leftover cake. Yeah, yeah, quite literally. In this room, <laughs> there's still a plate with bits of that cake on it that someone... Yeah. Had, yeah. These, this, these are the types of people I work with. You know, there's like a tradition at weddings, people will save the cake or something and put yeah. it in the freezer. So maybe yeah. next time I'm up there, there'll be some cake sitting around. Yeah, like, if the camera was turned around looking back at the TV, you'd all be extremely disturbed by the <laughs> amount of rubbish that is up there. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, but yes, exciting cake nonetheless, right? Yes. So, so this cake was cool. Good. Yeah, cake is good. Um, so, and, um, and there was some cool discussion, like on Hacker News. It was on the front page of Hacker News and all that. Um, so this is cool. Um, this is about uh, Nancy, full-time, um, so he's actually being paid full-time by a company to work on Nancy for Core CLR. So I thought that was really exciting. Um, this is the kind of stuff we love to see is companies supporting open source. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, Steve Gordon, uh, post on uh, sending emails. Uh, I believe he's using, what is it, MailKit? Um, so, or MimeKit and MailKit, yep. So. You know, a nice kind of walkthrough on how he's sending emails using ASP.NET. Um, this is, I believe, Matthew Abbott, and he's writing about uh, routing under the hood. Um, some nice charts, very beautiful. Nice. So, yeah, uh, Barry Doran's um, speaking about the data protection and authorization stacks. So it's cool um, to see some of these pose or these videos coming in from NDC. Um, so this this is one of those. Um, and so this is ASP.NET MVC 5, but um, always nice to see the kind of regular posts that they do from Stack Overflow. So this is Nick Craver, and he's posting about the, you know, stats and setup and servers and how they're running very high scale using ASP.NET MVC. Um, so, cool. yeah. So that's neat. 
Um, so this is, uh, let me zoom this a bit, uh, this is Scott Allen, and he's writing about avoiding the service locator pattern in ASP.NET Core. Goodness. So, yeah, always nice to see, you know, um, Scott writes great stuff, and this is a nice kind of architectural thing where he points out the difference between using using a service locator pattern, you know, going, getting a provider from HTTP context, and saying instead of that, you should really be embracing DI as it's built into ASP.NET Core. So, um, and he goes through how to do that everywhere. Nice. Yep. Uh, Shane Boyer. So I talked about, he's got this Pluralsight course, um, and I think this is part of what they cover in that course. Um, but this is the Legion of Heroes, which is kind of the um, tutorial you'll see when you go to the Angular 2 site. Um, they walk you through this Angular, or this, uh, yeah, Angular 2 app called Le uh, Legion of Heroes. So here he talks about how he got it running on um, ASP.NET Core and using Redis and all kinds of good stuff. Um, so this is, gosh, I forgot the name here. This is Matthew Jones. I accidentally called him Matthew Perry last week, and I'm very sad about that. Uh, but here he's talking about custom middleware in ASP.NET Core 1.0. Uh, cool. he's, he's done several posts. I, I think this is a new one. I featured a lot of his posts, so hopefully this is not one I've done before. Uh, so this is Anuraj, and he's talking about Entity 7, any, any Framework 7 uh, code-first migrations. Um, so he's been... Um, you can see in the archives on the right, he's been regularly posting on ASP.NET Core and Core-related features. And then uh, finally, I've got, um, we're doing the NuGet package of the week. So this is from Jeff Fritz, uh, picked this out. This is the Cake uh, script runner. Um, so it's a NuGet package, and then also the site. Uh, so this is basically the uh, C-sharp make, and it's a uh, cross-platform build Automation system. So, um, very cool. So that's it for me. I will awesome. stop my presenting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I will. Uh, I guess I will give people an update on where we're at. We're still working fur furiously to uh, get to a position where we're comfortable to give new dates. Um, I currently think we're probably another week or two away from being there. Um, if I think it would be fair to say if I was to take a stab at where we're going to land for an RC2 right now, it's still probably a couple of months out. Um, but we won't be updating the roadmap with dates, like I said, until we can be confident that those dates are something that we can hit uh, for the scope that we want. Um, so I think we're going to be pretty close to doing that either by the end of this week or the end of next week. Um, like I said, we've been taking week by week. We are working very hard right now to ensure that some of these core uh, foundational concepts that we need to nail in .NET Core and ASP.NET Core on top of it, uh, designed and thought through and and uh, you know, all agreed upon. So and with a clear understanding of how we're actually going to do the work, so we can make a, a good estimate as to when that will happen. Um, so we're all working really hard on that right now. Um, we're also still doing in terms of ASP.NET stuff. We're doing a bunch of performance work still. Uh, there's a couple of uh, devs on the MVC team are working furiously to improve performance of tag helpers. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the results of that work. A lot of it is around memory allocations and just basically getting things as trim as we possibly can uh, to make things as fast as we possibly can. So that's really good. Um, other than that, there, there isn't a lot of API change or you know actual sort of dev work going into ASP.NET itself. Most of the work right now is still focused on uh, that replatting of ASP.NET Core on top of .NET Core and kind of defining what that is. Like, what do I? How do I acquire it? When? I, what do I install? If I'm installing a dev machine versus a server, what does that story look like? Is there a, sp a spiritual successor to something like DNVM, or is that built into the box now? Um, so, as I said, in the next week or two, um, we'll be able to share a lot more about where we've landed on that. Uh, but right now, we're just sort of heads down, uh, trying to make sure that we. Uh, cover all the bases and uh, cross those T's and dot those I's uh, in, so that we can get a really good 1.0 out and then uh, uh, charge forward on doing the next version after that. Uh, so so yeah. how, can I jump in just a second. How does that work with, like, if someone's impatient, it sounds like now's not really a great time or you won't be able to follow this yet in the nightlies, right? Or in the, you know... So the, some people are still working with, uh, you know, the dev branches. Mm -hmm. um, 
you could so all of the ASP.NET dev branches, almost almost all of them, have been switched over to use the .NET CLI. So DNX is almost um, gone, <laughs> basically. Uh, we're very close to DNX being gone completely. Um, of course, we, there's no new Visual Studio tooling that anyone can install yet, including in here. We still don't have um, a, a sort of a repeatable uh, installer that people can use to install stuff. So most people are still using the DNX-based tooling. And so that still works to, to keep people functional. But very soon, that will all switch over to be .NET CLI. So if you're following along in the public, um, you're pretty much in the same situation that we're in. Um, so we're feeling as much uh, you know, any pains associated with that as, as anyone else. Um, and I, I saw this morning, there, you know, there are people following along. So you can you know, clone the repos as usual. And if, as long as you configure the right feeds, you know, look at the NuGet config file on the root of the repo. Um, and you use the most current version of DNX by updating it um, from the appropriate feed, or use .NET CLI by installing that from one of the installers, um, then you can get some way. Um, you can you can you know you can actually do development, um, but if you want to actually deploy somewhere, that's where it gets a little murkier right now because you know Azure hasn't been updated in terms of Kudu and things like that. But if you manually publish, you could get you know, an output that you could put in a server and um, probably get that to run, but it's certainly not for the faint of heart right now. Um, that will get a lot better in the next month, um, like I said, after this week or two, uh, when we sort through these uh, these sort of transitional issues. Um, but yeah, so, so like I said, most of the work right now is really focused on um, making sure we have a really solid design for what constitutes .NET Core and ASP.NET Core on top of that. Um, in terms of you know what you install and how you require and all those type of things. How does versioning work? Um, if I'm running on .NET Core of a particular version, what happens if I want to pull in a newer version of a particular package? How all those things kind of work? Um, these are new problems that haven't existed before. Previously, we had you know, stuff that was in .NET Framework, and we had stuff that was in NuGet packages, and they really didn't cross over. Now that everything is available everywhere, um, we have to solve a whole bunch of new problems that didn't have to be solved before. So we need to make sure we do that correctly. Uh, before we move forward. Um, so that's all goodness. That's all goodness. Um, and like I said, I really, really hope that we can uh, share dates soon because I, as much as anyone, want to be able to commit to a date uh, and you know give people that, that stake in the ground that they can uh, work towards. But we're not going to do that until we're confident that we can actually uh, deliver. So, Excellent. yeah. So there's wow. our, that's my update for today. Uh, how about we bang through some questions Sounds good. All right, I'll start with Mark Rendell. He's asking, I've been trying to get .NET CLI working on Arch Linux, but it needs Core CLR, so I tried to build Core CLR from source. But doing that needs .NET CLI, so I gave up and cried myself to sleep. OK, Sorry. that sounds about right. Like I said, not, not for the faint of heart right now. All right. <laughs> um, and like you said, that stuff's coming along where it's going to be a lot easier to install. You know, Soon. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, will analyzers work again with ASP.NET Core? I know in ASP.NET 5 they didn't. What is the latest on that? I've, I've, I, I want to say yes, but I'm not entirely sure. So I think the answer is yes, but I should double check with someone. Um, basically, there'll be nothing special about ASP.NET Core. So the question is really, will analyzers work in .NET Core um, in version 1 for .NET Core projects? Um, and if they do, then they'll work in ASP.NET Core projects. All right. Yeah. Uh, with CLI assembly or with CLI, the assemblies are stored on disk, not like DNX. Considering .NET Native is far from finished, can we assume when an ASP.NET Core app will be deployed, there will be DLLs with IL bytes stored on the disk? Yes, absolutely. So um, DNX, and you know, to be really clear, uh, we've said this before. When DNX did its dynamic compilation, its in-memory compilation, that really was intended for development time only. We didn't really expect um, or recommend that people did that in production. Like once you once you deploy to the server, we didn't really expect people would be um, not compiling ahead of time, just because you incur a startup cost um, with having to do in-memory compilation and then have it be jitted um, before it can actually be run as bytecode. Um, the .NET CLI is much more like uh, traditional .NET, so you run a compile step, you get out assemblies uh, in your bin folder, and then when you do a publish step, it takes those as well as all the other assets that you have and puts them in a flat folder output that you can use to uh, deploy to wherever it is that you need to go to. Um, so 
That's exactly how it will work in .NET Core CLI. And then there's the additional step. You, know, you have IL you know, uh, bin, uh, assemblies in your bin folder, and you can also go to the step of um, what we call cross-chaining those, which is the new version of NGen, which is essentially pre-jitting, so that you can um, avoid the cost, the startup cost of jitting your code by running it through a cross-gen step. Um, so we'll obviously be trying to do that as much as possible for the stuff that we ship out of the box. So if you, you know, install the ASP.NET installer um, on a server, ASP.NET Core, then you'll get all the versions that were contained in that uh, redist, essentially, uh, will already be cross gen on the machine so that you don't pay a, a, as much of a startup cost for those things. You will be able to do a similar thing for your own application as well, just like you've been able to do forever in .NET. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, question: What's the status of CS Proj to Project JSON project references? Yep, that's going to be in RC two. All right. So we're uh, will you officially ship and support Node services for RTM? Uh, so the current plan for the Node services work, and subsequently the React and Angular services on top of that, is that I'd really like us to be able to ship a beta. Around the, same time, around the same time that we ship the RTM of ASP.NET Core 1. Um, I don't think, I, I think we need to do a beta cycle on that, on that product uh, on top of the RTM so that we can get good feedback about how well it works. Also, it all, it, it all needs to be updated from where it currently is, which is all DNX land to .NET CLI land, and that we're kind of holding off on that work until we stabilize the .NET Core uh, CLI replat. And so I think what you'll see us try and aim for is a beta of the node services stuff around the same time we RTM. All right. Uh, what is the status of continuous integration with Team Foundation Server? Will the new CLI provide a better integration without or with minimal need for homebrew build scripts? Um, I actually don't know the specifics of that. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not privy to the specific uh, issues that people might have been facing with the Team Foundation Server stuff. Um, ultimately, you can either point MS build at your SLN file or your XProj file and build it, and it will build via MS build, which will call out to the .NET CLI, um, or you can just script the .NET CLI direct directly if you don't have any MS build artifacts in your project tree. Um, so whether there's first class support for that in TFS, I'm actually not privy to that, but we can uh, certainly find out. All right. Uh, will there be an intermediate release with .NET CLI stuff and then RC2, or is that what the RC2 release will be? Yeah, so that's something else that we're still determining right now. Um, I think at a minimum what you'll see is we want to get back to uh, stable dev builds that people can use. So you'll be able to get an installer from a site that came out of our CI server after it passed all our verifications and whatnot. You'll be able to you know, install using that installer, get templates, get some Visual Studio tooling, um, and but you'll be developing basically using Nightly's at that point, and you won't be pointed at NuGet.org. You'll be pointed at various MyGet feeds because you'll be using bits that aren't officially released on NuGet. Um, and then I think that at a minimum is what we'll get to, uh, and then we'll have the RC2 release that goes to NuGet and the normal channels uh, to download the installers and things like that. I don't think at this stage you'll see us do sort of a labeled or branded preview or beta again because we've already done an RC um, before we do an RC2. All right. Uh, is a core app pre-compiled on Windows uh, runnable on Linux or does it need to be compiled on each platform? That is a great question. That's, one, again, one of the things that we're working very hard on right now to define sort of those click stops. Um, so the goal right now is that you'll be able to, uh, the default project model for .NET Core and ASP.NET Core will be one that results in your application being portable. And so for a typical ASP.NET Core application, once you've published it using .NET Publish, that output will be portable, meaning that you can take that output, copy it from a Windows machine to a Mac or to Linux, and then you can execute that output by running .NET your app name, or DLL, um, using the .NET that was already installed on the, that other machine. So to say that a different way, I've got a Windows machine, I've got a Linux machine, I install .NET Core on both machines. Okay, I get the .NET Core for Windows on this machine, .NET Core for Linux on that machine. I build, compile, and publish my ASP.NET Core application on my Windows machine. I take that output, I copy it to the Linux machine, and then on here I run .NET, my assembly name, and it will run. 
So in that model, the publish output that I generated over here on Windows didn't include an executable. All right? It doesn't have an exe in the output because the exe is native, which would make it platform specific. Now the application wouldn't be portable. So the default model will be one of portability, but then there will always be that option to deploy what we're calling standalone, which is where you produce a publish output that doesn't require anything pre-installed on the target machine. But when you do that, you make a jump from being a portable application to a platform specific application. Okay, because you need to produce exes and native bits and the full runtime and the CLR, everything in your output folder, those things are all platform specific. You can't make that portable. Um, and so we're trying to find that balance between the default model being portable, which we think is the correct thing, and how much of a cliff you fall off in order to go into this standalone model. Like, what does that transition look like? And when do you have to go standalone? If you, there will be certain scenarios that are only um, that, that you'll only be able to achieve by going standalone because of some of the limitations of the portable model. And that's what we're working really hard, like right now, to define, because um, we really need to get that nailed down uh, before we can commit to a timeline. All right. Uh, is ASP.NET Core identity 100% backwards compatible with ASP.NET identity, DB schema, hashing algorithm, etc.? The reason I ask is a key extensibility point. Generics on the identity user appears to have been removed. No, so it's not 100% compatible, but what we have, what we've committed to doing is doing a point release of the previous identity so that you can do um, basically shared identity between an ASP.NET, like a previous identity app, and a new identity app, so that you can have the same logical user represented in both applications because both apps are configured to use the same um, store and use the same ticket type and those type of things. So we wanted to get that level of interoperability, but they're not like 100% compatible. Like the new identity API does some things differently, so the compact version that we will ship for the old one will require um, some slight modifications in the old application. And is there, you can migrate your existing users to that compat version? Yes, okay. right. that's the same thing. Yep. You can yep. take an existing app using Identity2, make some tweaks to it, and now that application can share its users with an Identity3 application on ASP.NET Core, and if they're signed into one, they can be signed in with the other, that type of thing. Great. <coughs> Excuse me. If you pre-jet binaries, will the runtime still monitor execution to improve the performance of hot code paths that oh, jumped around there, uh, that the pre-jet static analyzers may not optimize in the best possible manner, or can we rely on static analysis, pre-jet being great? Uh, no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's yeah. That's, yeah, so I mean, um, the, I, my understanding is the point is if they're, if they're specifically referring to the capability of the runtime JIT to um, emit, you know, more efficient bytecode uh, while the application is running based on how it analyzes code as being used, I don't think that's what they're talking about, um, then if you go through cross-gen, so that is you basically skip the JIT step, um, I'm guessing that you lose that capability, but I'm not actually sure that there is any difference between the bytecode produced by cross-gen versus the bytecode produced by runtime JIT. I'm, I'm not privy to that. Um, someone right. on the call may know that, um, or if Val was online, he might know, but he's not. So, uh, <laughs> But the intent is that if you cross-gen, um, it should be as good as if you didn't, because the whole point is to cross-gen is to avoid the JIT in the first place so you can just squeeze out every last bit of that startup performance. Cool. All right, uh, let me see. There's a question on what C, uh, what DI container is used in ASP.NET Core? Uh, so. We have our own DI container. So we wrote a sort of a baseline container uh, that has the baseline capabilities that we needed ourselves within the framework to write MVC and EF and those things, um, and was also sort of the the low watermark or the low, you know, the bar that all other IAC containers that you might want to plug in would have to meet. Um, so we didn't want to, we don't add a whole bunch of features to that because, uh, like I said, for those two reasons, we only wanted it to support what we needed out of the box, and we didn't want to make the bar too high for mm -hmm. plugging in external DI uh, by, you know, using opinionated features. And so the one in the box is perfectly capable of, you know, of suiting all the needs that we need for the frameworks themselves, but we fully expect that customers who are, um, used to using IOC containers from various, you know, other people 
will configure those in ASP.NET Core and use those. Yep, and it plugs in pretty nicely. You can override the DI yeah. container stuff. Uh, there's a question on if the community links are posted in the YouTube video. So I, I just pointed out during the community links part that we're uh, posting those on the web dev blog. Um, and then I'll try and copy those over to the YouTube video too because I just post cool. those as a comment and sometimes they don't get accepted because it's got a bunch of links and I think it shows up as spam. So. Oh, okay. Anyhow, uh, is anyone working with the Docker guys to create ASP.NET containers based on Alpine like they're doing with all the other official images like Node and so on? The Alpine I based believe, image? yeah, the, the Alpine's the micro image thing, like the small thing. I think that's the Honestly, new thing. I don't know. I believe the uh, answer yeah, is yes. He said it is. It's just five megabytes compared to 200 yeah. megabytes per Yes. Image. The answer is yes. Awesome. Uh, this says read the questions from bottom to top. I I'm reading from top to bottom because the most votes get to the top, and also yep. they jump around like crazy. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. I want to know if I am right. If we build applications with DNX, are we talking about ASP.NET 5, the old name, and building with new.NET? Are we talking about ASP.NET Core? Since I think there's a name naming issue and contradiction. My yeah. Opinion. I mean, again, this is just we can talk. About, I mean, naming. Yeah. This is a point in time. The thing that we released as RC1 was called ASP.NET 5, and it was built with DNX. The product has been renamed to ASP.NET Core, but we haven't done a release since then. So I am using the terms that way, um, although I don't. I tend not to say ASP.NET 5 at all now. So mm -hmm. I'll talk about DNX if it's the stuff that we've already released, and I'll talk about ASP.NET Core and .NET Core if it's the new stuff that we don't have an official release for yet. Got it. Uh, okay, I tried to install DNX prerequisites on Ubuntu following the doc instructions, but I cannot resolve dependencies. Do I need those or that huge ASP.NET Docker for production run-only server? Sorry, I don't know the specifics of what issue you're running into, so by all means, uh, log an issue on the home repo if you're having some trouble. Um, but from my understanding, the uh, Ubuntu stuff should work. I, there was some troubles in the past, depending on what version of Ubuntu you were using. We'd been using uh, a 14.04 LTS, and some people using 15 had run into some, some issues, but I'm not sure if that's still the case. All right. Um, let me see. Is there or will there be possibility to generate XML output from inside Project JSON? Currently, it is only available from Xproj. To generate XML output, I don't know what that means. Yeah, I was hoping you would. I can't follow that at all. all right. um, let me see. This one, I think, is already kind of covered, but is the StyleCop and code analysis tools working with .NET Core Roslyn Analyzer? Uh, that's kind of related to what we said before. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, let me see. Damien, last week you talked about .NET Core docs, including the project system. Did you see my pull request regarding that on the Core docs repo? Would love so your feedback. Specifically, what I was talking about last week wasn't user docs. It was conceptual docs to, for like program mm -hmm. managers to give to engineers and to everyone else so that we understood high level what we were building. So I did see that pull request, but I didn't comment on it because the stuff that we're working on has new features and some changes. Um, that we haven't settled on yet. So we, these, those are the docs I'm talking about. It's more like specs. Okay, it's like a, you know, okay, this is what we, this is the overview of what the .NET Core project model looks like. This is how you use it to build an application. These are the features it enables. Now, yes, that does sound an awful lot like user documentation, but this isn't at that level yet because none of it exists. So this is sort of setting out as if it, this is kind of that that strategy where sometimes a, a company will write a press release internally mm -hmm. before they've actually built the product so that they can use the press release that's announcing their new product they haven't built yet as the thing that drives how they're going to design and build the product. So this is kind of the consumption or product, you know, consumption first sort of model for doing this thing. Um, so the two things aren't really related. So if you, I, I, I did have a quick look at his, um, uh, the doc he put through. I think that stuff is fine for the what's there now, and I'll leave that to the .NET Core team uh, to triage that and all that stuff in terms of docs. What we, we were working on was more specifically um, stuff that helps us in the engineering process. Cool. Uh, there's a question on whether EF7 supports stored procedures yet. I don't believe it does. I'm looking at issue 
245 in the EF repo, and um, that's still open. So, okay. Um, all right. Um, let me see. Going through these here. Uh, actually, looks like you're just about. I think we're about done. Let me. Someone wants to know how many of the octopus. Uh, yeah. I have. I have one. Just, I'm going to get washed, <laughs> and so I just. Every day when the, when it's a Tuesday and I'm doing the stand up, I look at my various shirts and decide which one I want to rotate through. And today it was either some plain T-shirt or this one, so I chose this one today. Well done. Yep. Um, let me see. Will there be authentication middleware specific for Active Directory Federation services with OAuth two, like the ones for GitHub and Facebook, et cetera? That's OpenID Connect middleware, as I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, there is. Um, let me see. I'm going through. I think we're about done here. Will there be? Uh, yeah, actually, we already asked that one. I'm looking through because they jump all over yeah. the place. But yeah, I think I think that was all of them. Okay. Very good. Uh. <laughs> so maybe well. this week uh, was well, Scott still on the call? He's probably not watching, and so I know some people last week were. Uh, a little, a little disappointed that they watched all the way through to the end because Scott had to go, and then there wasn't some Easter egg at the end for them, like the Ferris Bueller uh, right. thing or whatever. Um, so maybe he'll, maybe he'll, he'll hear that this week, and when we I'm sign right out, there'll be something else. Oh, you're here! Is he I've there? I've been staring at you. No, he's muted. It says no, he's sorry, muted, I but I can hear his computer. It's been pissing me off. Excuse me, my friend. <laughs> So I don't know where you're speaking from, but it says that you're muted. So this is this is kind of creepy. Oh really? Yeah. yeah maybe. Yeah, maybe he's got like a monitoring oh, well, system hooked up there just to this keep one, an eye on you. This one crashed. What about that Hanselbot? Does that thing still wander the halls? No. No, no the Hanselbot's long gone. Long oh, gone. too bad. Corner somewhere. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, all right then. Should we call it? We shall call it. All right. Dramatic Goodbye. zoom engaged. <laughs> Bye. Zooming. Bum 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 bum.